Good morning, everyone, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Mike, and thank you to all the previous uh, speakers. I think we've got both the hardest and, in some ways, the uh, the most uh, challenging part of the program this morning, which is uh, I, I would broadly define as, as ground truth, uh, what happens when the big frameworks and ideas that we've been talking about uh, earlier this morning uh, actually collide with reality and not just the reality of the Security Council and, and the veto, although that's part of it, uh, but what actually happens on the ground. And uh, I think practitioners was the term given to uh, all three of these very distinguished panelists, uh, and that is a, a very uh, understated description for the enormous challenges that each of them has, has faced at various points in their careers inside of government, uh, as well as thinking about them outside of government, writing about them. So I'm just, I'm just looking forward to the conversation, and that's what we're going to have this morning. Um, and so I'm going to jump right in with everyone and start, I guess, with the, with the hardest problem that, that faces us today, which is uh, Syria. And uh, to what extent each of the panelists thinks that uh, that represents a, a challenge to even the, the basic idea of having an international framework when we see the political challenges that arise uh, at a time when certainly everyone, at least in this room, can probably agree uh, that a massive loss of, of innocent civilian life is, is a consequence of our inability to figure out some solution. Uh, so please, Heather, why don't you start us off and uh, uh, we'll just get going from there. Well, um, first, thank you so much to the co-sponsors and to Susan for um, including me in this very distinguished company. Um, and it's very difficult to follow the, uh, the two panels we've had already this morning. It's very humbling. But I think one way of approaching, Susan, the, the question of Syria is by comparing um, Syria with some of the, the conflicts that we tried to deal with before we had the R2P norm, and I think specifically Bosnia, because this is one that has come up in the media, and it happens to be one in which I served both in the legislative and executive branches of government, so saw it from both sides. And I think the two similarities that I would point out is that, um, for better or worse, we are only two years in. And um, we tend to forget, although those of us who lived through it, and certainly the folks on the ground don't forget, how very long it took the international community to come to something that could stop the violence in Bosnia. And here I come to the, to the differences because in, in Bosnia we had a regional legitimator in the form, in fact two regional legitimators in the forms of the EU and NATO. We had a future, a regional future that you could um, say to the warring parties if you want to be part of this. Um, and you had eventually Rwanda as a recent motivator. And this, I mentioned because it goes to this question of, of public opinion, that where um, when um, the distinguished earlier speakers did the work of putting the R2P norm together, we all, um, those of us of a certain age and um, global public opinion, were very motivated by the memory of Rwanda. Uh, right now, for all that we talk about the greater acceptability of the R2P norm, um, what motivates elite public opinion in the U.S. and other countries is Iraq. And that points you toward a very different set of lessons, and frankly, it makes it much harder to see Syria through, through an R2P paradigm. Now, the good news, and I do think there is some good news, is that two years into Bosnia, we were still fighting about whether it was legitimate for outside states to be concerned about what was going on on the ground. And what the R2P norm, I think, has comprehensively changed, um, as Secretary Albright and the others said earlier, no one can say they don't know what's going on in Syria. The UN system is one of the leading providers of undisputed information about the scale of the humanitarian catastrophe there. And we have tools like the ICC, um, like the human rights body, that have been active and engaged on, on Syria in a way that, that we didn't we didn't have in the Bosnia context. Now, that has not saved a single human life, which is a very sobering thing for us fans of, of R2P to, to take on. So I would sum up by saying what the comparison shows us is that the tremendous amount of work that was done on R2P has changed the terms of the debate, but what it hasn't changed or hasn't changed enough is the fundamental power relation that um, Ambassador Williamson talked about. 
Ambassador Burns, I, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on Syria, and then we, I definitely want to go back to Heather on this, this very provocative but also very sad notion that uh, it's an accomplishment for the UN to provide information about people being killed when it can't stop them uh, from actually being killed. So. Susan, thank you, and it's, it's also a pleasure for me to be here, and I, I really should start by thanking the Holocaust Museum, Sarah Bloomfield and Micah Bramwitz for putting this together with Brookings and USIP, and I think we should all thank Secretary Albright and Ambassador Williamson, it's great to see a Democrat and Republican working together on a leading international issue, and they've done, they produced a very important report. And, and for me, the takeaway is that responsibility to protect is an essential element of international security in the 21st century because people are being killed, more than five million in Congo, more than 100,000 people in Syria, not by interstate conflict, but by conflicts within their own societies where their governments are preying upon them. And you know, one of the essential foundation stones of this museum is to remember the destruction of European Jewry. Certainly we need to remember what happened in Rwanda. And we've got to use that template to think about the responsibilities that the United States has in the world as the leading power in the world. And part of it is to think about our self-interest, and that was mentioned this morning, always. But part of it is to think about what's right internationally and, and what our role is in mobilizing the international community. So if we think about Syria, it's very definitely complicated, Susan, I think, by the fact that, as President Obama has, has said, we're just coming out of this decade of war. We're looking in the rearview mirror. We're trying to learn, rightly, the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan, but in a way, I think our national debate in, in some ways is imprisoned by them, and we've become immobilized. And there's this presumption out there that those of us who advocate action on a humanitarian basis need to prove the case, and those who don't, don't need to prove it. And I think it might be the other way around. Uh, and so we created this di dilemma, I think, where the United States has to think very deeply about its role in the world. It's no longer the bipolar world of the Cold War. It's no longer the unipolar-led world of the Clinton administration when I was working for Secretary Albright, but we're still the dominant actor. What are our interests in Syria? We have a huge interest in the humanitarian catastrophe that's developed there. The numbers are really appalling. 100,000 people dead, 4.2 million people internally displaced, 1.5 million Syrian refugees outside of Syria in countries that matter greatly to us, like Jordan and Turkey and Iraq. There is an interest. It combines both the self-interest and the global interest. A second interest we have is a realpolitik interest. We should want to stop Iran from becoming a dominant country in the Middle East. But Iran and Hezbollah and Russia are arming uh, the Assad government, and there is no comparable counterforce opposed to them. There could be. It could be led by the United States with Turkey, with Saudi Arabia, with Qatar, and with some of the European countries, but it's not well led right now. And so I think um, the balance of the argument has to be towards intervention, more effective support for the refugees led by the United States, and more effective aid to the moderate rebel groups who need to take the fight in this war to Assad. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, I think you'll see, and there are, I think, a couple of articles, both in the Washington Post and New York Times this morning, we're probably looking at a very long war indeed. We should try to want to stop that war. So uh, I am very much with those people who believe that the United States needs to lead more vigorously and needs to do more to try to cope with this terrible war. Mm -hmm. Mike, both uh, Heather and Nick have, have raised the specter of um, the experience of the last decade, not in terms of R2P, but in terms of the Bush administration and its um, uh, the way it waged the war in Iraq and Afghanistan as being the relevant context to Syria as opposed to a humanitarian framing. Do, do, you, do you agree with that? And, and more broadly, what, what's your take on Syria? I think that there's a, a definitely a political context in which all this takes place. And that is a kind of national weariness with intervention. Um, if you look at the most recent Pew uh, polling on this topic, you have 40-year lows in support for various categories of global engagement. Um, that certainly is related to those events. Um, it also, there's also a serious foreign policy debate going on in the Republican Party 
about these issues, about the value of intervention. Um, and so you, you have a lot of uh, factors at work here. Um, you know, I'd I point out, um, I, want to, I want to get to Syria, um, but we were dealing with Sudan, Darfur, at the same time we were dealing with Iraq. And that was a limiting context even then, um, whether you're, when you're thinking about intervening in the middle of another Muslim country, uh, in the middle of, uh, of fighting a battle in Iraq. So that was a limiting factor even then. So I, I don't want to um, deny that. Um, the, but I guess I agree with the earlier commentary that we've heard all through this event, which is important, um, is that the needs that uh, persecuted minorities in the world face and American national interests are not determined primarily by matters of psychology. <laughs> They're actually determined by interests and values. Um, and uh, Syria is a case where we often talk about a conflict between interests and values, and it really does, I don't think it exists in this case. Um, when we were dealing with Darfur, uh, it, a terrible humanitarian crisis, but instability in Darfur meant instability in Chad. Um, instability in Syria means instability in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, um, along the Israeli border. And Syria is a proxy, increasingly just a puppet of Iranian influence, having been supported by that influence. And so I, I think we've got a, uh, you know, those, you've got a real confluence of those things here. But I want to be sympathetic with the administration on this, having, having lived through some of it. I think that's one of the lessons of formers when we approach these things is that they're not easy. Um, is that the application of the responsibility to protect in the context of an active two-sided civil war is not an easy thing. Um, particularly when neither side is kind of pure in this, in this conflict. Um, and that I, I think is a uh, you know, context that we need to take um, seriously. Um, in general, I, I would just point out more broadly that when you face the choice between war and allowing impunity, the focus needs to be on producing better choices than this. Um, that's one of the disappointing aspects for me in the Syrian context is that this began as a peaceful protest mm -hmm. um, in which we, it might have been possible to take a more active role. But even there, I would just you know, point out, because I don't want to be too harshly judgmental on this, that it's hard enough to take action when there are real atrocities. It's, it's very difficult to take action when there are prospective atrocities down the road. Um, you know, that, that is a, uh, something that requires a lot of leadership and foresight, um, which, which are, are not always easy to, uh, to show in a situation like this. And there is a tension at the heart of some of these issues between the understandable desire to use force as a last resort and the desire to take early preventive action. <laughs> okay. um, you know, you, sometimes early interventions uh, can avoid terrible consequences down the road, even avoid um, cycles of conflict and revenge. One of my fears in Syria now is even the triumph of the rebels would result in terrible revenge. Um, so early action can, uh, can undermine some of those dynamics, um, but it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do when the threats are prospective. Mm -hmm. hey, Ambassador Burns, let's go back to this question of, um, what's in the toolkit for someone sitting in the White House at the senior job in the State Department uh, as this has played out. So you saw this during the Balkan War. Um, you're familiar with the Bush era debates uh, and that balance between also what, what's a military uh, tool in the toolkit, what are diplomatic tools. Does it help or not to think of uh, something like R2P as a, as a legal uh, resource in, in a situation like that or ultimately is it really about politics? Like, give us a sense of, of the mix as you're considering uh, what to do when a situation like Syria breaks out. Well, I'd agree uh, with Mike that um, one of the problems in Syria um, is that there's a risk of action, 
and there's a risk of inaction. And Secretary Albright referred to this when she was speaking too. It's difficult uh, for the president, and I have great sympathy for the president. I very much support him. It's really difficult to make this decision because you can see the course uh, of American leadership. You can see why that would be in our interest to get more involved, to try to help with this regional picture, to prevent an Iranian victory, to prevent Iran and Hezbollah from teaming up, to strengthen themselves, and to help our allies that Mike talked about. But you can also see that um, I think you also have to see uh, the, the risks of, um, of inaction as well. If you don't act, you probably see that victory by the Iranians. You see further su suffering by the civilians. The biggest question the president has to answer is, is there a scenario that the military can present that is achievable, that has an end state to it, and that is affordable? And it was very interesting to read this open letter, the letter that was publicized by the White House that General Dempsey sent to the Congress. This is obviously a very difficult action to foresee. Arming the moderate rebel groups is not as expensive or as risky as setting up a no-flight zone. So you've got to distinguish between the two. But the president's going to have to ask those questions. Um, he's also going to have to ask whether the United States can rely on others to work with us. And again, Secretary Albright referred to this. Responsibility to protect with the U.S. in the lead does not mean the U.S. alone. And in this case, I think there are a large group of countries that want the same ends as the United States and Syria but don't have a leader. They're accustomed to the United States playing that lead role, and that's not happening now as a further further complication. I think finally, Susan, you have, the President's going to ask, do we have the diplomatic wherewithal? Do we have the, do we have the ability to lead on the ground? Um, and I think in this case we certainly do because we still in a political sense are the most influential country in the world. We have a legion of friends both in the Arab world who want to be helpful here and want the U.S. to lead as well as in Europe. So I, I would argue that if you look at that balanced question, what's the risk of action versus inaction, I think that the weight of action, uh, the risks are stronger for us on inaction and that this, this is a doable proposition that the United States could be more active in supporting the moderate rebel groups in trying to isolate Assad and take away the great advantage that he has now in the resupply that, uh, by Iran, Hezbollah and Russia. It's interesting that most of your arguments um, have made the very compelling geopolitical case, uh, you know, for where the U.S. national interest lies there. Do you think that the humanitarian case just just isn't sufficient to overcome the uh, public opinion uh, concerns that, that Mike referred to? Well, I think in this case, interestingly enough, and this doesn't always happen, the United States can't intervene everywhere, and it's not in our national interest to do so. I think our national interests and the humanitarian interests of alleviating the conflict mm -hmm. actually coincide. Mm -hmm. And for some Americans, that humanitarian impulse is going to be very convincing. For others, it's going to be the national security argument. I think, I think they're integrated, and you really need to make both arguments to the Congress and the American people. So, Heather, thinking back, you referred to, to your time in government and it, the Balkans conflict that erupted. Uh, would it have been, in, in what ways do you think it would have changed the U.S. response or would it have been useful to you in your role uh, had the, the world adopted something like the responsibility to protect framework uh, at that time? Or is it better or worse to have a policy against uh, atrocities, to have an official U.S. atrocity prevention board and then to have atrocities occur while that board exists or, or not? Well, um, I think there's a certain number of um, speeches that I helped Secretary Albright get ready to give about why we should care about what was going on in the Balkans, and maybe um, she would have had to give somewhat fewer of them. Um, you know, I was sitting here and thinking about what were our successes and failures and, and where, where the tools came from. And so I wanted to, um, in the spirit of bipartisanship, mention a, a bipartisan success and a, a bipartisan failure. And the bipartisan success that nobody actually knows about or talks about is Macedonia. Um, where, um, and I was just thinking, but if we hadn't intervened in Bosnia and Kosovo, if we hadn't seen two sets of mass killings, um, would we have been able to muster the will, both the U.S. and the EU, to take the, um, send troops to help keep a peace in Macedonia so that you were using that part of the toolbox where you weren't firing weapons, but you were putting the parties on notice there were weapons that could be fired. 
and with some difficulty, first the Clinton and then the Bush administration um, very successfully partnered with the EU to prevent the kind of conflict that had broken out in Bosnia and Kosovo from breaking out in, in Macedonia. And that was done on the one hand without the R2P norm, on the other hand with the hindsight of, of years of violence in, um, in the Balkans. Um, one of my most searing memories is of going um, with Secretary Albright to West Africa. Uh, just as the conflict in Sierra Leone was winding down and everyone understood that there were continuing extensive regional tensions that required a lot of outside support. Um, and there was also a lot of excitement about Mali's new democracy. And there was a lot of eagerness in the administration and in Europe to support the government of Mali. Um, and to support the other countries of the region. And um, as I say, it's a very searing memory for me that one morning we were in the region, we picked up our, our news clips back from the US, this was in pre-iPhone days, and um, some member of Congress had um, sort of inquired as to what the secretary was doing over there pouring more money down a rat hole, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so when recent events happened in Mali, I thought, you know, we had a decade to use all the nonviolent R2P tools, and we tried to use some of them, and we, the US, and we, the international community, failed there across multiple administrations and multiple governments. And so when you're talking about, you know, that's a case where we use, we had all the nonviolent tools and we at least tried to use them, but as, a, as an international community, we failed. Mm -hmm. Mike, would it have made a difference during the Bush administration for something like the responsibility to protect to be more enshrined, for there to have been an atrocity prevention board? Would that have done anything about Darfur? Um, first of all, I'll point out that the, um, the administration, the responsibility to protect was an internal commitment of the Bush administration. People, our people helped produce the document and, and, uh, and uh, approved it. So I think it represented this spirit that the president brought to a lot of these matters, and which I saw on issues like Darfur. I mean, at least the mythology of Rwanda is that there wasn't a, enough high-level attention. Um, you know, if George W. Bush had spent any more attention, he would have had to quit his day job. Um, <laughs> he was constantly on this issue. Yeah. Um, but this is the source of frustration, to some extent, from my own experience. Um, we employed just about everything you can employ in the toolkit when it came, when it came to this and tried to do it in a, in a timely fashion. The president talked about Darfur as a genocide. He ordered intelligence overflights of Darfur, declassified the photos within weeks in order to call attention to, the, to what was going on. We provided massive aid, over $2 billion in humanitarian aid, 65% of the total. We pursued sanctions against individuals and corporations. We worked with regional organizations, equipping and moving AU forces. We, uh, the president, I heard him on the phone trying to get NATO involved, and Chirac and others refused to get involved in, in, in the matter. We gave tacit support to the ICC, at one point threatening to veto uh, an attempt to undermine the indictment against, uh, against Bashir. Um, we sponsored the peace process, tried to work, you know, the Darfur rebels. I was there in, in Nairobi when we were trying to make them more presentable in, this, in these in negotiations, which was a difficult task, kind of a motley crew. Um, the result was a humanitarian achievement. A lot of lives were saved um, because of massive levels of aid, but very, very little progress on the security side, and really these events went forward with, with impunity. Um, it points to the ultimate problem here, which I think, as, at least in my limited experience, you have to take seriously. And that it's that a sovereign state dedicated to destroying a portion of its people with the support of China and Russia and the Security Council and the cover of Arab solidarity and the Arab League is a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, you know, Bashir, by the time I met him in 2005, when Bob Zelik and I were in, in, in Khartoum, um, he felt almost no pressure in the, because he was shielded by a variety of these, uh, of these factors. Um, and we could not, uh, and nothing would have happened in this circumstance, it did happen without 
the ability to generate a credible threat of force. And we could not do that for, for the, some of the reasons we've talked about, but also for diplomatic reasons, like the context of the North-South Agreement, which was taking place at just the same time to avoid, you know, to bring a conclusion to a bloody civil war. Um, and also, and I'll point because it's out that it's newsy, um, that uh, the, uh, the military, the Department of Defense, was one of the largest, they were not a neutral actor in this. They were one of the most vigorous opponents of any action that related to humanitarian issues in Darfur. And uh, as you're seeing in Syria with the testimony uh, or the information that we, we see today, um, to the point where I had the experience in, in and I won't go into details, but to the point of near insubordination when the military would refuse to plan for the possibility of events that the president wanted planning um, because they didn't want the, 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 uh, the plan to ever be called upon. Um, and so there's a variety of kind of problems in this about coming up uh, you know, with, a, with a credible uh, uh, threat of force, the plan B that we talked about in, in, in uh, Darfur and could, could never produce. And that it's hard sometimes when you have dedicated offenders in this to get much progress without that credibility. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure we're all thinking of uh, Secretary Albright's uh, uh, famous line when it comes to uh, the military and whether they should uh, be called upon uh, in, in crises like this uh, to, to step up and take action. But I wanted to, to highlight and, and, and ask the others to respond to your point about the UN Security Council, which has sort of come up in many ways. It's, I don't know if that's a, a tool in the toolkit or a negative uh, tool in the toolkit or uh, just a, another weapon that, that trumps the toolkit, um, but uh, clearly many conversations, uh, not just about Darfur, but about Syria, come back to the veto in the, in the UN Security Council. Do you see that as, as, as basically trumping many of the tools that we've developed? Well, it's the fundamental problem that, that the Obama, Obama administration has in Syria is that it doesn't have a capacity to use the power of the Security Council, which can be considerable in this case because Russia and China, in the most cynical way, are blocking even a coherent discussion of how to respond to the humanitarian crisis. Not just you know, whether or not the Security Council should intervene politically or militarily. They don't want to give any credence, any role for the Security Council in Syria because they they're protecting Assad. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, uh, the administration faces the same challenge that the Clinton administration faced, as Secretary Albright said, in 98, 99, when it became clear that the Russian Federation was going to veto any uh, military intervention in Kosovo, despite the fact that Milosevic was just about to annihilate a million Muslims there. The United States was forced, and this is really to the great credit of President Clinton and Secretary Albright, was forced to take up leadership of its own. We used the NATO alliance, it worked very well. A very successful example, as was Bosnia, of American-led military interventions to save people in a very difficult situation. So in this case, the United States has to create a coalition of willing Syria of its own. But as I've said before, Susan, I think we have many countries ready for that. And one way to think about this, um, David Miliband, the recently, uh, who has just left British politics, he was British Foreign Secretary in the last uh, Labor government, is now going to take up the presidency of the International Rescue Committee in New York. He gave a really insightful speech 10 days ago at Ditchley, at the annual Ditchley mm -hmm. Lecture outside of Oxford, where he essentially said, you know, we have to understand that um, we're at a time when 10 years ago, there was a lot of criticism of the US and UK for intervening, intervening too frequently and too aggressively in the world. Now we're at a point where there's criticism that those two countries and others are not intervening sufficiently. We don't have a big enough sense of our own role. And he said something at the end of the speech which really resonated with me. He said, I prefer, um, I prefer the course of activism to prevent problems rather than passivity in reacting to them. And that's the essential choice that we face in Syria. This problem is so severe in its geopolitical implications and humanitarian as well. It will be with us. The question is, do we engage and lead now and hopefully have a chance of ending the Assad regime sooner? Or do we wait for that country to tear itself apart? The humanitarian crisis will be greater. And then we perhaps have a bigger problem because as Mike has said, Lebanon, 
Turkey, Jordan are engulfed by it, and it's Israel's northern border as well. So to me, that's the calculus that the president's got it, and the administration has to face. So Heather, it seems like we're having one of those very Washington conversations. It's, you know, there's a, there's a seductive power to the idea of a policy and a toolkit. Uh, you know, that's a wonderful phrase to an American ear. There's a toolkit to deal with atrocity. There's a toolkit to deal with genocide. But really, we're talking about politics, aren't we? So what's your, what's your view of the, the politics here? I, uh, I have been known to ban the phrase toolkit from the, the stuff that we put out at the National Security yeah. Network because it is, it is such an, an inside the beltway construct. And I actually want to talk politics on the global level first mm -hmm. because the Security Council, um, for better or for worse, um, carries with it a degree of legitimation that nothing else matches. But there are other routes to getting legitimation. Um, you know, we talked about the role that NATO and e the EU were able to play in, in um, Bosnia and Kosovo. And the big global political challenge that I see in um, Syria is that we simply don't have a body, a structure, somebody that can give legitimacy to the kind of coalition of the willing that, Nick, you're talking about. And I, um, from a U.S. national interest perspective, but also from the, from the perspective of the legitimacy of R2P, frankly, that if you see a coalition of the willing acting in Syria without some ability to say, we are representing the will of the people of the region, particularly when it is so clear that you have some regional proxy conflicts going on, um, that that will fatally undermine both an effort to end the conflict and deliver another blow to the, to the norm of, of R2P. And I think what's particularly challenging in the American context is that um, you made the argument, and it's one that has great appeal to many people, that one of the reasons the U.S. should get involved in Syria is due to our geopolitical conflict with Iran. Now, that does not sit terribly well globally with our assertion that we would be getting involved in Syria for humanitarian reasons, nor does it sit well with the idea that we could be a fair or neutral arbiter of what comes out afterwards. And this is a challenge that we face. It's a very, very real challenge in Syria, but it's something that we're always going to face with R2P. Um, and it's something that, that um, has made it very difficult in the U.S. political context because we, we live in a period, for better or for worse, where national security is very politicized and that we have, frankly, as I said, we're all um, the Rwanda generation and the generation that has come up after us, um, Susan, everybody that writes for you, everybody <laughs> that works for me, everybody that work, um, does not see this does not see, is not seared by Rwanda the way we were, and doesn't necessarily believe that there is such a thing as disinterested humanitarian intervention. And we haven't figured out either to talk to our own elites or to talk globally how to, how to square that circle and say, yeah, we do have an interest with respect to Iran and we have a humanitarian interest, and both of those things are, are on the table. And I see that as a really fundamental political problem for R2P globally. So I want to bring in, I want to get to Nick, but I also want to make sure that we get at least a few questions, because I'm sure everyone has, has a lot of uh, questions for this great conversation to keep it going. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you all have those. So start thinking what your questions are. And uh, Ambassador Burns, I'll let you uh, respond to Heather. Well, I'm, I'm, I think we're in agreement that countries and governments act for a multiplicity of reasons. And it's the responsibility of the president to think first and foremost about what's good for our own country, but he also has an international, an obligation to think internationally. And in this case, uh, I think you can use both of those arguments in a compatible way. I don't think it's a contradiction to assert that we have narrow interests, geopolitical interests, I should say, uh, as well as humanitarian interests that should guide us here. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, can I just add real quick? I, I think norms like responsibility to protect help create momentum even internally within government systems to raise the, the profile of these issues and the decisions that are made. It's the reason I, I'm a big supporter of the Atrocity Prevention Panel. It takes away excuses, raises things higher in the system earlier. Um, I think that's all to the good. I also think advocacy groups play an important role in this to provide some cons political constituency and sometimes cover for these issues. 
uh, you know, Save Darfur and a lot of other groups played an important role in, in raising profile. And, but I, I would only add that ultimately it's a matter of national will by the main actors in the international system, um, whether they block things or whether they push things. Um, and how you weigh the cost of action and inaction. And, you know, the, the real goal here, the important goal, these things are, these type of interventions are seldom popular in any circumstance. Libya was not popular. Um, and uh, 